presentation is going to be divided in three parts. The first part is a reminder of what is a European arrest warrant and what it's like, the apparent uh, simplicity and the real simplicity of the mechanism, but uh, problems underlying that. Second part would be giving you a comprehensive overview of the troublesome areas with some examples of the case law from the European Court of Justice. And the third part would be that of uh, presenting on double criminality, one of the traditional issues related to European arrest warrant that uh, where we have uh, had some novelties and making me, this is a personal opinion, to be a little bit more optimistic than I was, let's say, two years ago. So starting by the European Arrest Warrant, you all are judges, prosecutors, and uh, uh, people who are familiar with the European Arrest Warrant. It's not uh, uh, necessary to spend a lot of time explaining in detail what the European Arrest Warrant uh, is and what is its functioning like. But uh, I would like to remind you some key ideas. We are facing a powerful instrument, a very efficient instrument, a brilliant instrument, a successful instrument. Uh, out of my experience as a, a judge, over 30 years of experience, we've been dealing with the issuance of uh, orders for 20 years, uh, more or less, uh, since uh, the frame of decision came into force in the year 2002. And I've never came across with a rejected uh, order. We've had a, a request for supplementary information, postponed uh, surrender, uh, conditional surrenders that never have a uh, rejected uh, request. That uh, is, a, is a piece of data that uh, uh, speak uh, volumes about, about the, the functioning of the order. On the whole, the order uh, works smoothly and efficiently. And this is a very important instrument because it deals with uh, basically with deprivation of liberty, deals with people that, who are going to be transferred from member state A to member state B, either to stand trial or to serve sentence, but is dealing with uh, deprivation of liberty, one of the most valuable assets of people. And the other factor contributing to the importance of European arrest warrant is, is the the first order of its kind is all the DNA of the mutual uh, cooperation within the area of freedom and security and justice based on mutual trust comes from the European arrest warrant. Therefore, any uh, this, uh, progresses we made uh, in relation with European arrest warrant could be applied to the rest of the, of the orders. But having said this, Cooperate in, in Europe, cooperate within the European Union is not the same as cooperating within national borders. We all we all know that, and we need to to bear in mind that we are not just cooperating as if we were with, between national judges. So we have some some rules. The, those rules are the grounds for refusal, which are could be quite complex uh, at, at times. The European public order, which is to say fundamental rights issues, the differences between system not fully harmonized and the difference, uh, differences between procedural schemes. So what in principle was very simple and very smooth and very efficient and over 90% of cases is, is likely to present uh, problematic areas. If you link at this if you click on this hyperlink, I couldn't do that while presenting. You find a commission paper updated to the year 2021 or 22 with a lot of statistics and uh, information concerning European arrest warrant. As uh, Ramin has said, uh, I'm a member of a judicial uh, cooperation national network in Spain. We assist judges when dealing with uh, international cooperation matters. And every time I, I get um, a question from a colleague, they tend to be basic questions, how to issue 
uh, the the order, how to fill the form, how to find uh, out what a competent authority is. They tend to be ba basic questions telling me or giving me the impression that uh, judges, at least in Spain, are not very familiar with the European arrest warrant. Every one of us have heard about European arrest warrant, but when it comes to reality, it comes to apply, a significant number of them are not as familiar as they could be expected to, to be. So most of my questions are basic ones, although we have faced a number of complicated ones too. One of the most interesting is a re recent case where a judge asked me about Article 9.3 of the European Framework Decision, which is that uh, way of uh, if you go to this box, when you're going to issue an order, you have two options. So either the whereabouts of the person are known or unknown. In the case are unknown, you can issue an alert and place the alert on this SAS system. And that, according to the words of the frame of decision, that alert is have the same effect as an European arrest warrant if it has all the information of Article 8.1. Well, the case of that just was, was a very interesting question was that of uh, the equivalence between uh, alert issued at the CS and sent to the ISIS system and uh, the a genuine European arrest warrant and posed a number of interesting questions. But on the whole, questions are simple, meaning that judges, at least in Spain, are not that familiar and meaning that the functioning of the warrant is in principle quite simple as well. But this is a scheme from the from that uh, documentation on the Commission website. You see, very schematic, very neat. Uh, the procedures, the uh, time limits, and so on. Are there grounds for refusal or not? You can summarize uh, the functioning of the European arrest warrant in few lines. But if we move a little bit forward and we start uh, with the grounds for refusal because a significant part of the problems and uh, sensi sensitive topics uh, related with the European arrest warrant lay on the side of uh, execution. If you go to the execution, you see, well, grounds for refusal. And uh, grounds for refusal, there are quite a few. There are, not, uh, uh, there are not three or four grounds for refusal. There are quite a few. You can see in Article 3 and 4, and you have additional warranties to be given in Article 4a and 5. Each and every case of uh, grounds for refusal could pose a lot of challenges and could pose a lot of interesting questions in, in front of you. So, so to speak, we we learn by mistakes. We are applying a very effective, a very brilliant and efficient instrument. But if we have to progress, if we have to, to be better in applying it and making it better, we learn uh, out of, uh, we learn from uh, our mistakes. We learn from gray areas. We lay from the areas and from the cases where things are not that clear. And these grounds for refusal are the perfect testing bench for, for that. So this could be, we can call that in inverted commas, the traditional grounds for refusal. But since the year uh, 2016 with the uh, Ana Yossi and Kadara joint cases, we have a new perspective, a completely new perspective as for the grounds for refusal. And this per perspective has to do with the preservation of fundamental rights. It is to me the most uh, fascinating area of uh, European arrest warrant. We had that Article 1.3 from the very beginning of the European arrest warrant. This is in the, in the test of the frame of decision, but it wasn't until the year 2016 what this grounds for refusal, even in italic. Uh, letters 
this ground for refusal didn't came into to the to the to the front line so it was kind of laying there well we all have heard about uh, article 1.3 but uh, uh, it was in that year when uh, the courts of germany sent a, sent a preliminary ruling reference to the court in luxembourg asking about what to do with article 1.3 and this article 1.3 says that nothing in the frame of decision that shall have the effect of modifying the obligation to respect fundamental rights and uh, legal principles as enshrined in article 6 of the treaty of the european union a completely new uh point new uh, point of view new paradigm in the way we we cooperate and we use a European arrest warrant. So to complete this um, or to perform this uh, overall uh, view, this offsite on the overview on the European arrest warrant, we have a lot of uh, a lot of resources. We have information from Eurojust, we have a professional experience, we have the case law of the European Court of Justice. But I'm going to focus on this European implementation assessment and dating back from the year 2020, which is a very comprehensive document and uh, which uh, put forward in a very clear way all on one on the one hand, the evaluation crit criteria, what uh, was assessed, and on the other hand, what are the challenges? Some of them are decades lingering ones and it uh, drafts as well some recommendations so starting uh, taking us as, as a starting point this uh, european implementation assessment uh, we are going to analyze some of those areas i told you that uh, could be problematic it is very interesting uh, in this document that you can see what are the challenges, proportionality, double criminality, nevis in idem, in absentia cases, preservation of fundamental rights, etc. But if you look at them, they were there from the very beginning of the orders, proportionality, double criminality, nevis in idem, meaning that we are still having the same problems that we had 20 years ago. Some of those those problems hasn't been completely solved, hasn't been solved as for any of the single difficulties they could pose. So we, we're still facing and working to be better in a operate European response, for instance, in terms of proportionality. There are in the paper as well recommendations, and most of them have to do with uh, not using the European arrest warrant for minor crimes, increase training, and uh, restore, restore to alternative measures, and so on and so forth. So going back to the overview, and the overview, we're going to split in two parts, issuance, difficulties, and uh, executing difficulties or challenges or problematic areas and name it as, as you like. As for the issuance uh, point of view, most of the problems lay on the side of uh, issuing authorities. We have a, a, a very important uh, doctrine for, from the European Court of Justice telling us uh, what is the judicial, what should be the judicial decision uh, accord, uh, ordering to issue an European arrest warrant, or this the judicial authority, and analyzing most of them, most of the quoted uh, decisions here, analyzing whether or not the public prosecutor could be considered as an issuing authority. And in, in actually, all the cases, what the court has said is, well, a public prosecutor could be considered an, a judicial authority in the terms of uh, Article 
to one of the frame decision, provided it works uh, in an independent uh, context. Is he or she are not taking any order or instructions are not dependent uh, on the instructions uh, from the executive, from the uh, political powers of government and so on and so forth. And ac according to that rule, the court has decided uh, regarding prosecutors from uh, Germany or from Sweden or from the Netherlands or Poland or whatever, whether or not they were they satisfy that uh, criteria. And the important things are the prosecutor, uh, the, the judicial authority, which is an autonomous concept of the European Union law, has to be independent, has to ensure a dual level of protection, has to ensure the proportionality check, and the most important has to be fully independent from the, from the executive. So you have a significant uh, body of doctrine here. Uh, the, the latest uh, decision I bought is the OE case, which has to do with the specialty principle and the public prosecutor as the nation authority was the case where the first uh, European arrest warrant was issued by a prosecutor in the Netherlands. Uh, and later the courts in Luxembourg said that the prosecutors weren't entitled to issue an order. Later on, a a request to apply Article 27 of the European Framework Decision uh, was sent to the executing authority, now from a judicial authority, from a judge. And the court analyzes whether the first request was sent by a prosecutor if a judge was entitled later on to ask for the lifting of the speciality principle. And we have also a Z case where it uh, has to do with the position of the public prosecutor as an executing authority and not just as an issuing authority. Interesting court, uh, interesting series of decisions that uh, basically are about that. And uh, the second chapter on the issuing side is that of proportionality. Uh, is a constant in the in the doctrine and the constant in the jurisprudence of the European Court of Justice that we need to bear in mind proportionality all the time. But every time I, I, I reflect on this or lecture on this or even uh, write on this topic, I said we, we have we have a uh, clear rules in the frame of decision. 12 months of max uh, of imprisonment or four months depending on if it, it is an accusation case or a conviction case. And within the, those limits, every 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 proceedings where a, a penalty that uh, meets that uh, limiting criteria is is valid is uh, you could issue a European arrest warrant provided you have, a, a case where the penalties that could be imposed or have actually been imposed are, are um, in line with the provisions. So what is the proportionality? What, to, what do have to understand by proportionality? Because we have clear limits as for the penalty that could be imposed or are have been imposed. So proportionality is bearing in mind not to resort to European arrest warrant for minor cases, for less important cases. Do not uh, overread the system with a lot of requests having to do with less important offenses. But it's not that it's not that that easy because I have a case where the the penalty imposed is one four months and one day, and I. I, I can issue an order. Otherwise, uh, the frame of decision should have been worded uh, uh, establishing higher limits. So it's not that easy to, to grab the uh, idea of proportionality, but fortunately enough, not just the case law, but uh, the lawmakers in different uh, member states have established uh, higher limits. Uh, uh, this is the case in Spain, 
you can check by clicking this uh, this hyperlink as well. And the case in Spain is that the judges, if it's an accusation case, cannot issue an order unless the public prosecutor or the accusation ask him to do so, cannot issue an European arrest warrant if the penalty imposed at that or that could be imposed is likely to be suspended. And thirdly, cannot issue an European arrest warrant unless the offence is a, the offense amount to to be one of those entitling the judge to send the person to pretrial custody and not all the offenses allow judges to send the people to pretrial custody have have to be serious offenses so we have clear uh, uh, instructions in the, in the law in the spanish law as for how to apply that uh, proportionality criteria Moving to the execution uh, side of the European arrest warrant, there are a series of uh, of uh, areas and where, as we said at the beginning of the presentation, we have clear rules in the frame of decision, but when it comes to apply in practice, is the, the things are not that clear. For instance, we have hearing and time limits. We, we know that we have very clear limit time limits 10 days if the person has given his consent, 60 days if the person hasn't given his consent to be in, to be surrendered. But in practice, we do have a number of cases where those limits, time limits, cannot be, cannot be fulfilled. We cannot uh, uh, execute the order within those limits. And you have a, a number of cases, Jeremy F., Lanningham, or even TC case. TC case is a, is a case from the Netherlands and the court in the Netherlands asks a European Court of Justice, what about the case? We have a preliminary ruling reference and we need to keep this person in custody because otherwise he's going to, to, to flee. And that uh, we have a provision in the Netherlands law telling us the 90 days is the maximum amount of time uh, allowed for the person to be kept in custody. And the, and the court says, well, we do have these limits, but reality is we cannot uh, comply with these limits. And if if we are facing the risk that the, the, pepper, that the person to abscond, we have the risk of impunity, which is uh, a notion that the court in Luxembourg has always in mind, you have to, to keep the person in in custody for over 90 days, meaning that the law wasn't uh, has to be interpreted in, in the line of the frame of decision and has to be amended because it's not possible to think that after 90 days, if you have appeal series of appeals or preliminary ruling reference or whatever, you have to free the, that person because the person is going to flee the country and uh, justice uh, cannot be served that that way we have a no number of cases as well uh, concerning article 23 which is once a decision of a surrender has been made how to apply uh, the, the the surrender how to make effective the surrender within the limits and uh, related with pandemics and delays and so on. double criminality i'm going to go later on in 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 depth of, uh, on this issue, the interplay of frame of decision or European arrest warrant in 909. 909 is a frame of decision of transfer of sentenced persons, and there are a number of areas where the, those these two frame of decision overlap, uh, posing interesting questions. Never seen even surprisingly, it was till the year. 2018, where, where the court in uh, Luxembourg faced for the first time the Nevis in Idem, um, asking it, it, if it was a concept for for the insertion of the person in the proceedings or a, a concept uh, having to do just to, with, with the person, meaning it, that person has uh, been part of the proceedings but just as a witness and he has given uh, evidence as a witness. Later on, it became uh, an investigated person, an accused. So the, the court 
faced for the first time the subjective or objective nevisinism. Very interesting case as, as well. Trials in absentia is another point where we have a, we have very recent decisions from the court dealing with the matter of uh, the guarantees that trial in absentia should have this LUMPH case is the case where the what uh, a suspended uh, sentence was uh, afterwards uh, revoked and uh, where the court established uh, its doctrine of the the requisites of article 4a are applicable to the second sentence and not to the decision uh, revoking the suspended uh, conviction and finally fundamental rights uh, unfortunately we don't have time to go uh, over this matter and perform a, a deep analysis of this matter but this is to me is the, the most important because i'm not uh, fully capable to predict where the the doctrine of the court in, in luxembourg is going to to be uh, what uh, will be the lines uh, i have I have my own opinion, and I've, I've written about that as well, but uh, the recent case law, especially this EDL judgment, uh, uh, has given me a new insight or new materials to reflect on this matter. As I told you, it wasn't until 2016 where fundamental rights concern Hope up, and we have a series of cases around Yossi, LM, ML, a number of cases, Puch Gordi involving in Spain as well. And was um, most of them, or all of them, de dealt with, uh, have to do with cases where the, we find found systemic deficiencies and uh, the impact of that, those systemic deficiencies in a particular case. So I was uh, from the, I had the opinion from from the very beginning from Aaron Yossi and Calderaru and later on with LM uh, decisions that if, if we have article 1.3, we could have two scenarios. One is a scenario where there are systemic deficiencies that impact in the, in the specific situation of the requested person is okay. But I was, I had the opinion from the, from the very moment that if we hadn't systemic deficiencies and we have a case where neatly we can uh, assess that fundamental rights were at risk or were uh, vulnerated or could be vulnerated, we have to apply Article 1.3. Well, the court in those uh, decisions, Aaron Yossi and that uh, saga of Aaron Yossi, always have been saying that we need to perform the two two steps to two tire assessment, and we need to have systemic deficiencies and impact on the specific case, until until the court reach this EDL judgment, where the system is could be it could be thinking uh, again, we could be thought again, we could be give a new review to to that doctrine. But because in this EDL case, the court has said, well, if the health of the person is endangered, of where there is a significant risk for the person to be to be to have the his life expectancy shortened or to run a serious uh, risk life or whatever, if there is a serious risk for the person's life or health, have uh, related to the transfer decision, we can stop hot proceedings, ask the the issuing authority if the situation could uh, could uh, change, if there is a possibility of uh, uh, making some arrangements for to get rid of those risks, and if not, if the risk cannot be cannot be ruled out we could uh, refuse the, the surrender. So with this decision, I, I have a kind of confirmation that uh, 
a systemic risk is not required in any case at at was my theory from the very first moment and going to to double criminality issues yet again if we go and, and, and read uh, articles 2.2 2.4 and 4.1 of the European arrest one frame of decision the wording is pretty clear we have the 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 top 32 offenses in Article 2.2 were provided there is a penalty for seeing for those offenses of at least three years of imprisonment without uh, verification of double criminality, uh, the surrender has to be performed. For the rest of the offenses, there is an optional ground of refusal. And according to that optional ground for refusal, if the facts are not an offense uh, in the executing member state. The executing member state could could refuse the order. And uh, according to the words of Article 2.4 is, uh, has uh, con the facts constitute, constitute an offense on the law of the executing member state, whatever the constituent elements or however it is described. In principle, to be pretty clear, later we have a lot of um, academic uh, researchers on what is double criminality, what is double criminality or double prohibition, meaning it's not a crime but uh, infringement or, or whatever. But in essence, in essence, uh, double criminality is the correlation in the way that uh, a a fact is categorized as an offense in both issuing and executing member state. From the court, we have a the court uh, in Luxembourg hasn't been very keen on resorting to in concrete or in abstract comparison criteria. And uh, it has given us some guidance on what uh, double criminality is, but not always uh, not always in the same manner. So we can, you can find decisions apparently uh, not saying exactly the same things, which are called the, the Kronstadt-Piotrovsky paradox, as I'm going to explain right now. We have, uh, regarding double criminality, let's say four, four decisions or five, but the most important are Grunstadt case, which is a, a 99 decision case, Piotrowski case, the A order, and more recently, KL uh, decision. Apart from those, uh, we have the X case, which is a case uh, where, where Spain is, is again involved. In that X case, is a case of uh, is is the simplest of of, of all of them. Is the case of a rap rapper or rapist, I don't know how to say, which uh, has uh, been convicted in Spain for humiliation of victims of terrorism and and uh, for uh, um, and a offense having to do with the freedom of, of uh, expression and, and terrorism uh, acts. So it was uh, sentenced to two years of imprisonment and later on in Spain, the law was changed and a higher threshold for those crimes were set up. And uh, in that case, the court says this, uh, the, the threshold of the three years uh, established in Article 2.2 is not the threshold uh, in force when the order, order was issued, but the threshold in force when the crime was committed to give legal legal certainty. So it's a pretty clear case, but has to do with uh, with the double criminality. Later, the, the most important case until KL, uh, I have to say, are Grunsta and Piotrowski. In Grunsta, the court was uh, in, in Luxembourg, the European Court of Justice was in favor of a broad uh, field uh, for analysis, as in giving the executing authority the opportunity to go into 
uh, details to some degree of details to perform a, a throughout examination of the case and to find out where there was not exact match between the offenses at, as it was categorized in the issue member state and the executive member state, but what are called a legal classification echo. So, you know, something that resembles the, the, the way the, the the offense is categorized in member state A and member state B, and uh, not uh, completely uh, the court not completely in favor of establishing a a parallel of the interest uh, protected in, in both member states, but in favor of having a degree of coincidences or a similar interest protected in both member states. To, to sum it up, this doctrine of uh, Grunsda was uh, gave, gave raise to the German authorities in the year 2018 to reject the surrender of Mr. Puigdemont to Spain. Puigdemont was uh, sought as an allegedly perpetrator of a rebellion, sedition and uh, crimes and the, the German authorities did perform an analysis of the case saying that if those uh, deeds have taken place in Germany, they wouldn't amount to be a crime of, of such nature and uh, merely public disorders and something like that. And according to Grunstad, uh, um doctrine, they rejected to, to, to hand over the guy to, to Spain, the gentleman to Spain. Well, this was one of the bricks of the, how to construe the building of double criminality, but we had another one, which is Piotrowski. In Piotrowski, a juvenile well, was, sought by, was sought by Poland to be tried as an adult, according to the Polish legislation. But in Belgium, there were a, a different scheme for the people aged between 16 and 18, and telling that uh, it was necessary to perform a detailed analysis in terms of uh, if the person was going to be tried as an adult or as a juvenile and so on. And the question was, to what extent are we Belgium authorities entitled to perform an analysis to conclude whether that person could be tried as an adult or just as, as a juvenile and act accordingly. And in that uh, case, Piotrowski, the court was very strict, uh, more strict than in Grunsda, and narrowing the limits of, of the analysis and saying, well, you, you, cannot, you, cannot, go, you cannot go that far. You cannot go that far. You, you, you just make sure that the offenses or what the person are sold in in the in the in the scope of the frame of decision and you you cannot be placed that you, you're not in a position that entitles you to review the whole case again this is this is incompatible with a, a mutual trust and mutual recognition principle so we had that Grunsta and Piotrowski paradox we had that um some years ago, two or three years ago. We have even uh, an older case, it's, a, it's an order, the order A, which is important as well, completing the charter. And that in that order, what the case said was, was the important penalty threshold is that of the issue member state. The case of stake was that uh, where the penalty imposed for one of the facts uh, acts committed by the assault person was in one of the member states merely a fine, whereas in the issue member state was uh, uh, a imprisonment pen prison penalty was for for that act, and the court reminded, well, important. Uh, uh, legal uh, configuration of the facts is that of uh, issue member states. So if you don't foresee a, a prison penalty for that conduct, provided it's foreseen in the issue member state, you cannot go and analyze to that point. 
this is this this has a second meaning that uh, lack of coincidence between the, the penalty imposed in both issuing and executing member state has to do with the legal interest protected and that uh, gave, gave us a hint as in the, the coincidence of legal legal interests protected are not uh, of a, a crucial importance in this matter of uh, double criminality and finally which is the most important judgment so far in this uh, matter i'm going to conclude in about three minutes sticking to the time limits have been given is K KL uh, case. In KL, KL is, uh, it, to me, is a significant leap in, in terms of uh, interpreting and construing double criminality. KL was a gentleman who was convicted for a series of acts committed in a G, GH uh, meeting in Genoa, Italy, and he got 12 years and six months of imprisonment as the perpetrator of a number of, of offenses. Among them, devastation and looting for which he got 10 years. Uh, the, Mr. KL was in France and the court of uh, France, uh, courts in France rejected the, the the surrender and the case went on appeal to the Cassation Court. And the Cassation Court halt proceedings and sent a preliminary ruling reference to the court Luxembourg asking three three simple but very deep uh, questions. Uh, damaging and devastation plus three to public order was was the notion of the of the offense committed in Italy. But the, the public peace is an interest protected in Italy, but not in France. So we have the difference of interest protecting both sides of the of the frontier. Second question was: there is a partial lack of uh, dual criminality because this guy has been uh, convicted as the perpetrator of seven offenses, and two of uh, of them are not a crime in in France. And what about proportionality? The penalty uh, Mr. KL got in Italy could appear disproportionate if we applied uh, Italian legislation. So what the court answered here is very important and give us a, a very significant guidance. The court says, it's immaterial that there is a different interest protected in Italy or France. Don't pay attention to the to the different legal interests protected. Second, is, this, this is the constant. You have to be restrictive as for uh, when it comes to interpret uh, grounds for refusal. Third, the double criminality assessment should be limited to verifying if the individual's conduct should amount to be a crime, both in the issued and in the executing member state. Whatever the crime is, is a crime or is not a crime. The partial lack of, of, of dual criminality is as well irrelevant and the proportionality principle becomes completely marginal here too. In other words, you have to send a person to, to Italy because uh, Article uh, 2 and 4 of the frame of decision uh, your parents for frame of decision don't give you the opportunity to refuse uh, surrender in this case. If you compare all those judgments, Grunsta A and KL, we are we we can see an evolution in the doctrine of the European Court of Justice, uh, and we have I, I, I'm there to say we have clearer rules today, much more clear than we had in 2018, where that uh, Puigdemont case uh, took place. And we are more capable to foresee that uh, today a European arrest warrant issue is not going to be refused under some kind of uh, 
in-depth analysis or some kind of uh, a detailed assessment or uh, detailed examinations. So the rules are clearer and more in favor of the surrender and narrowing the possibilities of the executing authority to assess uh, uh, double criminality in terms of coincidence of interest protected threshold of penalty or even proportionality.